So welcome to today's ISC um, Handshake webinar. We've produced this event in partnership with, with Handshake. We have an annual partnership agreement with Handshake. Um, a lot of work we do together. Um, and one of the key pieces of, of, of work that we've done over the last few months has been Careers 2032 in partnership with Hand, Handshake, also Wonky and also AgCast as well. So it's been a really good thorough piece of work that you may have seen coming through through, through other channels. Um, my name is Steve Ishwood, so I'm Chief Exec of the ISC and I'm going to be the host for today's webinar. Um, we've got a great section of presenters and panelists, so we'll be um, getting into quite a bit of bit of detail, really good content um, that I'm sure you're all going to find very useful. Um, a quick idea about, um, sorry, a quick, <laughs> a quick piece around how, um, how we normally run our webinars. So um, please do use the chat function, get a conversation going, and um, also use the Q&A box, that would be helpful. So um, all our speakers um, um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. We've got some time allocated at the end specifically to answer questions from yourselves, um, a good 10 to 15 minutes. So please do populate that. I'll be keeping an eye on that and I'll, um, and I'll, I'll pass those questions on um, um, towards the end. Um, the agenda. Um, very, very shortly, I'm going to shut up and hand over to Emily and Chris, who are going to be giving the highlights from the research that I just mentioned. And then really pleased also to be joined by Andrew Barger of PwC and Monica Fowler of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And we're going to be talking, um, have a panel conversation around the themes and some of the issues that, that, that came from the report and also broad, more broadly what's happening um, in the early talent space at the moment. And then, as I said, we've got some questions at the end. So really good hour session lined up. We're, we're going to be finishing um, on the nose at, at three o'clock. So as I said, please do pop, put your questions, any thoughts, ideas um, into the chat and Q&A functions and we will come back to those as we go along. Right, that's enough for me. Let's get, let's get into the content. Um, Emily, can I hand over to you first and you can take it away from here. Fabulous. Thank you, Stephen. So let me get my slide up. Can I get a thumbs up? People can see it. Yep. Fabulous. So thank you everyone for joining us today to have a little explore of Careers 2032, which is an industry research paper looking at the career sector of 2032 and the role that technology could play in facilitating human connections. So today um, we've got some wonderful um, speakers and panellists with us today. Um, we've got myself, I'm Emily Johnson, I'm a Relationship Manager at Handshake. Um, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Chris Anthony. I look after our employer partnerships team at Handshake. Um, so I've been here for about a year. I spent my entire career in the talent acquisition space, either with businesses focusing heavily on graduate hiring or with businesses trying to disrupt your traditional recruitment methods. So, um, yeah, delighted to go through some of the findings today and, and nice to see everyone. Fabulous. Thank you, Chris. Um, I should mention I work on universities and students side as well. <laughs> so we're also joined with some fantastic panellists today. So Monica Fowler, who works in talent acquisition at Enterprise Holdings. We have Andrew Bargery, sorry if I butchered your last name there, Campus and Schools Engagement Leader for PwC. And we have lovely Stephen, who's introduced himself as Chief Executive of the ISE. So let's get into some findings. But first, before we do that, we're gonna talk a little bit around methods um, and participant numbers. So Careers 2032, Imagining Future of Career Services, um, was a joint partnership between AGCAS, Wonky, the IC and Handshake. Um, it involved careers professionals, employers and students. We had over 159 employers, 817 students and student union representatives, and 131 careers professionals. Um, we went on tour across the country. We hosted 15 roundtable discussions in Bristol, Manchester, Birmingham, Edinburgh, and London. And we also did an extensive online survey to gather that quantitative, quantitative data um, for those who weren't able to join the roundtables who wanted to also participate in the research. So that's a little bit of behind the scenes. So Careers 2032 was designed to provide insights and discussion topics. It's all around raising awareness, supporting universities, career services, student unions as the move for the next decade. We covered themes around a truly integrated approach for inside and outside of the gates. We focused on impact and scale powered by technology and collaboration, connection and closing gaps. So there were common themes in what we discussed, but we had very different groups of people to discuss these key themes here. 
Now I'm going to hand over to Chris to start talking about the employer picture. Yeah, thanks, Emily. It was a it was a, a great uh, series of events, and we had some really interesting discussions with a lot of our employer partners. Um, if you just go on to the next slide, what I'll start to to go through with everyone is just some of the key findings that we had uh, in speaking to our employers. Um, so there's you know some interesting stats and numbers on the on the screen, but I guess if we think about the initial priorities of a lot of the partners that we spoke to, um, 68% of our employers were mentioning that, you know, attracting equality and diversity and inclusion was front of mind when it comes to engaging with top talent. Um, that's, a, that's a trend that we're continuing to see more and more with every single employer that I end up speaking with. And it was evident in the, in the report. Um, an interesting one here is that in 10 years time, Will they be recruiting for jobs that don't exist today? 81% uh, of our employers um, that we spoke to felt as though some of the jobs that they're recruiting for today will be replaced. Um, and that's a very interesting take on the innovation that we're about to expect, you know, the change that's come over the coming years. So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what, what happens there. Um, and then also in terms of, you know, actually engaging with students at the right time and being able to utilize uh, technology potentially to, to have these meaningful conversations. 78% of the employers we spoke to would want to engage with students and pupils even earlier in their journey. So outside of your kind of traditional timings in which you would speak to them. So um, yeah, interesting set of initial findings there. Um, you can go on to the next one, Emily. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking at the technology that's going to play a positive role in, in creating the dedicated early talent networks to support ultimately what we're looking to facilitate is the connection between graduates and employers. Ma a massive percentage of the employers we spoke to, 78% felt as though technology would bridge that gap. Um, so that's kind of what we were expecting to see. Um, Another thing to, to kind of think about when it comes to employers and the timing of which they're trying to engage with students and uh, essentially competing with, with uh, their competitors around graduate recruitment is historically, are they gonna be tied to events like the milk round? You know, are employers going to be trying to engage with students at the same time? And most of the employers we spoke to felt as though in the future, it's not gonna be tied to, to the specific times, which is good. It allows you to, to speak to um, students kind of all year round effectively. Um, and then I guess finally, in terms of, you know, one thing that we wanted to look at, we obviously spoke to a lot of different businesses of different sizes that come from different backgrounds, different um, types of brand awareness out there. And, and if we look at, you know, the results that we saw from our SMT employ uh, SME employers, um, a big portion of what they were struggling with was to reach the right candidates. That was their top concerns compared to businesses overall. So, you know, that potentially boils back to their general brand awareness and, and what they might need to look at um, from that perspective. So um, some interesting results to come out of a lot of the conversations that, that we had. Um, next one, Emily. Thanks. Um, just to kind of recap and, and point out some of the, the, the key findings from an employer perspective, obviously connecting students directly to employers and, and how technology might play a part in that. 78% of, of employers felt as though technology will be key in facilitating those, you know, uh, interactions. Um, I won't go through every single one that's on the screen here, but, you know, automating information and advice, 75% of our employer partners felt as though that's going to play a key role in the graduate recruitment of the future. Um, and obviously looking at the student employer interactions as ongoing. So as opposed to the preset timings around you know, the milk round and specific events like career fairs that are taking place, making it more um, available for employers and students to directly connect via technology was a, was a key part of something that might change in the future. So some really great results that came out of the conversations. And, uh, and, and yeah, just to kind of summarize, you know, the employer side of our, our meetings and the roundtables and the discussions and the, and the research that we, um, we undertook, I think it's obviously evident that technology is going to play a, a huge part in the future, um, how we can facilitate the adoption of career services and students and universities and bringing everyone together is going to be key. We really want to drive you know, engagement, diversity, and, and ultimately identify the right talent. And uh, a lot of our employer partners felt that you know, technology is the way that we're going to be doing that in the future. So um, 
yeah, some really interesting results. Um, I haven't had a look at the chat, but any questions, et cetera, ping them in there and we can go through them in more detail. But hopefully that gives you an idea of, of some of our findings. Fabulous. Thank you, Chris. It's really useful. Um, and yeah, as Chris was saying, it was such a diverse bunch of people. It was great to be in the room with them. And um, there's some interesting findings, hopefully some you might not have thought of before, but hopefully some familiarities there as well so that you know you're on the right track. We also spoke to students um, and student union representatives as well. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the key findings relating to that group. So we asked students, where would you be most likely to turn as your first port of call if you had questions about all of these different areas that are on the left here? So the first one to point out is the impact that Google and other search engines um, have on students accessing careers information. So students were saying that they are most likely to turn to Google when it comes to information on opportunities that are available to them as well as networking opportunities, which is really useful to know, but not really that surprising. So um, we probably are all familiar with students kind of starting that first initial search on Google, not really knowing what to put in the search engine and just hoping that there'll be some kind of magical answer at the end of that there. So when I was looking at these results, what it was getting me to think about is how can we make sure that if students are going to Google, first and foremost, they're equipped with at least the right questions to start looking on there and the right kind of critical thinking skills to be able to work out what information they're accessing on Google and the kind of um, whether that is right for them and their career interests. What was also interesting here was the impact that career services have on a student's um, kind of first explorations of what they wanted to do. So opportunities to connect with employers and professionals, students said that they would turn to you, career service professionals, for this. Um, so that's really great to know that students um, kind of understand the key part that you can play in connecting them with employers. They also say careers fairs and events, so it's good that they're aware of the local opportunities that are available to them through their university, but also advice on interviews and other recruitment practices, so assessment centres, psychometric testing. So that is quite um, positive to hear, in my opinion. We know that um, careers guidance is something that takes a lot of time, a lot of training to develop the skills there, and it's useful that students are able to identify that the career service may be one of the many places that they can, can go to for that information there. Most interestingly, um, in my opinion, is the, is the impact that a wider social network can have on a student. So lecturers, for example, they were saying they'd turn to lecturers, academics for advice on skills, knowledge and experience, as well as mentoring. Now, we always know that um, within a career service, it's important to have connections to academics. I think embedding careers into the curriculum is something that is not only increasing in kind of popularity and need, but will continue to increase in the future. And when looking at these findings, what it encouraged us to think about is how can we make sure that academics and lecturers, if students are turning to them as part of their wider careers network, how can we make sure that they have the right information for students? They might not be trained careers guidance professionals. So therefore, there's that distinction there between the level of information that these people are able to offer your students and how we can make sure that as kind of our connections grow, hopefully, with departments through in curricular activities, we can make sure that they're able to tick off these areas, so skills, knowledge, mentoring, that students are turning to them for. Other interesting findings that came up um, from the student roundtable discussions, I won't read the quote at the top, but I think it's very interesting to understand how um, students sometimes feel that the careers um, service isn't for them at that moment in time. It might be a bit intimidating and overwhelming. So there's a little bit of myth busting needing to happen around when you can access careers. It doesn't need to be when you, you know your career and you're in final year. So um, it was interesting to have that theme reiterated. 40% of students said their top priority is finding the work interesting and that's well ahead of what they said for salary concerns so there's been this shift from the salary 
being the main driver for students when it comes to looking at job opportunities to it being interesting to them and that shift to kind of more um, the kind of moral and emotional um, benefits that can be offered by certain roles. 27% of students said that their biggest obstacle to the future is not knowing what field to go into, um, which I find fascinating, to be honest. Um, I, I know that, as Chris was saying, from an employer perspective, that um, the roles that are out there may be changing in the future, in the next 10 years with automation, we may be recruiting for roles that don't actually exist today. And students seem to also have a little inkling into that uncertainty as well about not knowing what fields to go into. Lastly, 19% of students said that limited opportunities in the geographical areas in which they're looking for roles presented barriers to employment success. So um, it's not just around kind of the personal network around students, but actually within their local area, what opportunities are available to them? And are certain students from certain demographics going to be more or less um, challenged by barriers that are, are faced by um, geographical location there? So that was a little bit from the student perspective. Um, it was really fascinating. It was great to have uh, students in one room, career services in another room. And what we were trying to get them to do is to start thinking about similar topics to see whether there are any key things here. So as you can see, this table mirrors in some ways what the students are saying, which is actually quite useful from a data point of view to know that um, they're, they're on the same line, so to speak. So. We asked the over 100 careers professionals, where do you think your current um, cohort of students would turn as their first protocol if they had questions about the areas listed on the side here? So firstly, it's really great to see how positively career service professionals rated themselves in these areas. It was great, both from our point of view as, as our research group to not be asking you things that you don't think are applicable to the career services at all, but also to understand that career services have a wide breadth of opportunity for students to interact with. There were some similarities, however. Google was the number one place that you said that students were turned to for information and opportunities available to them. And this mirrors what was said in the student rooms as well. So there's a joint understanding there about Google and other search browsers being that first touch point in a student's career journey. What was also useful um, to understand was the impact that lecturers and parents, carers and guidance was on, on a student when it comes to their uh, advice and guidance on what career might suit them. So again, it, it, it's useful to understand that students are probably not just going to turn to one person for opportunities and to be able to explore a wide breadth of um, perspectives in their network. So again, it brings up the same questions around lecturers, parents, how can we make sure that these people feel equipped to be able to um, have these tricky conversations with students, but also how to make sure that um, if they're not going to have that information, do they at least know where to point students and loop them back into your career services and employers to make sure that students get the information that they need. Again, lecturers also had um, a big impact on skills, knowledge, experience and support finding work experience. So um, this is probably quite prevalent for those courses that have placement years as part of um, the courses, but also those that have work based modules. So in curricular activities are increasing. And over the next 10 years, we saw that lecturers are going to continue to have an impact on where students turn to both in terms of skills and knowledge but also work experience as well. Lastly some more facts around career students we've found that 95% um, of career professionals say that over the next decade they'll need to demonstrate impact and value within their wider university and that's going to be the biggest challenge here so um, as the need for more internal collaboration increases and um, yeah, you build those networks with academics, with parents, with other employers in the space. How are you going to make sure you get the data to show that you are demonstrating an impact there? Um, so that's something to mull over. They also, career professionals also said that there'll be a need to increase their use of technology to personalise the digital student experience. And that 
start to come in to foreshadow some of the questions we may ask later. How can you balance between both kind of personalization, but also doing that at scale using technology to be able to offer that experience for students that feels like it's tailored to them, but actually from your perspective, is easy to set up, easy to facilitate through the use of technology. And lastly, this won't be a surprise, but it was interesting that it was reiterated that well-being and careers are intrinsically linked there. So it's this kind of wider um, student experience that careers and those that interact with students are covering. It's not just about what job they're going to do or what experiences they're going to have at university. It's about them as an individual and that personalised approach to both their needs, their interests, but also their well-being as well. So what comes next? Careers 2032 is not over yet. We have some very exciting um, webinars and opportunities to catch up on if you haven't heard about it already. But we also have five live events. So we're going back on tour. Um, we're going to the five locations we were in before. So Birmingham, Bristol, Manchester, at London, Edinburgh, I think I've called them all, um, for some live events where we will have panellists, we'll be talking about the research, we'll be talking about how to use it in everyday practice, so taking these big findings, what does it mean to you as an individual, so we'd absolutely love to have you all there, it, we've got students, we've got employers, it's for career service professionals as well, so anyone who would like to get involved, they can visit the link here, um, if it's not in chat already, if one of my lovely colleagues wouldn't mind putting it in chat, that'd be amazing. And you can also download a copy of the full research paper on that page as well, if you want to dig into some of these findings in more detail. So I'm going to hand back over to Stephen to do the panel events. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, we've already had some some um, some action in the chat and the Q&A box, so good to see that. And please keep that coming through as we get into the, the panel conversation. As I said, any questions that you've got, so you'd like our panel to ask, pop them into the Q&A box. I've got it. You see me looking sideways? There's my monitor I'm looking at. I'm not looking out the window. That's where the questions are. So um, so let's get stuck straight into, into, the, into the panel piece. So I'm really pleased to be joined by Andrew and, and Monica. So a kind of a first question just to get started. So but if you could also just give us a little idea, a bit of an idea of, um, of, of introduction just just who you are and the role you have so I and mean, if I can turn to you Monica first so yes just give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and then can you just give us a bit of an insight in terms of actually what's happening this recruitment season how are you finding it is it competitive difficult I'm sure it's not um, a walk in the park so tell, tell us what your thoughts are. <laughs> No, it hasn't been. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, well, um, welcome everyone. Um, great to be here. Uh, I work as a graduate management um, recruiter uh, and also um, recruit for all different types of roles, not just for graduate roles, but also uh, placements and some of the roles in our um, offices, um, head offices, administration jobs, IT, um, and some, some technical roles as well. I started um, in our graduate management training program as well here in, um, in Barry St. Edmunds is where I started my training program, although I am originally from the US, uh, as you could probably tell from, from my accent. I've been here, I just had my 20 year anniversary with Enterprise. So I've seen, um, I've seen its growth. Um, and um, I think with that, it kind of leads me on to the, the challenging um, uh, um, piece that we're, we're, we've now found ourselves is um, because we've had um, the restrictions lifted. It's really fair to say that we've been uh, we've resumed as a business um, sort of business as usual with with customers returning to their pre pandemic travel requirements, which is great because our business is built around growth. Um, we have a fast track training program. It's all about the development, and this is great. Um, unfortunately, uh, for the recruitment department, it means that we're also see seeing similar happening with other employers. So there's basically a lot more choice for, for, um, for graduates, um, those being already the ones that have graduated in the last um, two or three years that are uh, working in perhaps um, retail management, hospitality, um, which, which means it's, um, it is incredibly more difficult for, uh, for recruiters, especially uh, for ourselves in enterprise, um, to, to get to the level of, of hires that, um, that we need. We need to see uh, about 50,000 applications this year to get to our 1,500. Um, so those are big numbers. Um, so all hands on deck uh, at Enterprise to um, to make sure that we uh, we do fulfill our goal and, and those needs for for our groups. 
Cool. Thanks, Monica. Um, same to yourself, Andrew. Would you like to do a sort of a little bit of an introduction for those that don't know who you are and then um, just give us a bit of an insight into how you're finding this um, recruitment season? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Afternoon, everyone. Um, Andrew Bargery. I work as part of our wider student recruitment team at PwC. I've been here for uh, what's just been 18 years. Um, so I've been, been around for a little bit. Um, my role is I, I look after all the work we do with, with universities and schools across the UK. We recruit uh, around about 3,000 school leavers, graduates, undergraduates on a whole host of programmes. Um, how, how's this year been? It's definitely not been a walk in the park this year. I don't think it's ever a walk in the park. Every, every year is different. This, this year, I think, has been one of the toughest I, I, I can remember. Um, we, we're recruiting. Um, we've got the highest number of vacancies um, to, compared to what we've had in the last decade. Uh, and it's really interesting. And, and, and speaking with Steve and some other, em other employers recently as part of some of the forums that the IC do and looking at some of the data. And, you know, yeah, we're in line with most sectors. We're, we're seeing this seeing this real increase in, in opportunities, but in, in terms of application levels, uh, pretty much stagnant stroke, a little bit lower than, than the point that we, the, or, or the, the level that we had this time last year. So not a brilliant recipe that, is it? Um, increased vacancies, but lower applications. So it, it, it's been a real challenge. And again, speaking with, you know, speaking with students, doing focus groups, speaking with university contacts, speaking with you know, other employers, the ISC, High Flyers, you know, a whole host of, you know, different organisations. And it, it's really interesting, you know, a couple of things that have come out as priorities for students have been focusing on getting a good degree. Great. Yeah, that, that's really important. But also focusing on having a good time, you know, now that, that now that students can can do a little bit more than they've been able to in the last couple of years. And, you know, there's a big part of me which thinks who, who can blame them and, you know that that that's great and fantastic that they can do more but it presents you know it pre presents a lot of challenges for employers and i think we're we're generally worried that you know are we gonna you know are we gonna fill fill up all of our opportunities this definitely feels like there's more pressure than ever uh, or certainly more pressure than i've known to to to, to try and fill those roles the, the other thing as well you know to, again talk talk to steve and the ic and other employers around you know potentially could we try and do more more PR, PR to put out there that so many sectors are, you know, in, uh, are recruiting these not necessarily record levels, but certainly um, strong levels of opportunities. And and I guess there's, there's 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 two two schools of thought. You know, are students thinking, is there still some of that pandemic pessimism of mm, there's no jobs available? And actually, they're wrong with that thinking because there are there's lots of great opportunities, and we've seen this real hike. Or is there that view of, yeah, I'm aware there's lots of jobs, but because there's lots of jobs, I am going to relax and maybe I'll apply in July or August time for an autumn start. And obviously, if that does happen, that's going to create a, an even more chaotic summer than usual. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's been really interesting and, and certainly very challenging this year. Yes, and from what both of you said, that, that bears out stuff that we've heard across our, our sector groups. Um, just to prove that I'm looking at the, um, the Q&A on the side, I've had a question from Louise talking about, is it our graduate um, application still over 90 per vacancy? Um, that was our stat from the last recruitment season. Um, you can't really tell mid-year because it's kind of, you know, does the market catch up? Um, so, but but the the intelligence we've had so far, roughly half of our employment members are saying that applications are down on this time last year, um, with also one or two concerns over quality. So definitely that um that that picture's replicated pretty much across the across the board. Um, with I mean, I think when we look at the data, it looks like vacancies are probably pretty much at a record high as so everybody catches up post pandemic. So um, definitely a very competitive market. We'll echo your thoughts there. Um, I wanted to talk to you both a little bit around diversity. And I know for both your organisations, you know, having worked closely with yourselves in the past, that diversity is very important, has been a long time. Um, so my question was actually, what is it in that kind of onboarding, recruitment, development phase that you're focused on now to improve the diversity of your intakes? I'm sure the pandemic has, has had an effect. So I just wondered how your how your sort of your thoughts, your practices might be might be changing. Do you want to tackle that one first, Monica? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so we've seen a big shift in, of course, um, student behavior during the pandemic. Um, obviously, they weren't on campus. Um, they weren't going necessarily to their uh, careers teams. Um, they weren't 
um, interacting as much. Um, so it, it's obviously become a challenge less um, are you utilizing the career services. Um, and so we um, realize that we need to do more outreach. Um, so one of the ways, of course, is just um, you know, using social media to engage with students that are um, online. Um, and, um, and secondly, when we do engage with them, um, either that be through um, events that we do on campus, the virtual events, um, or um, when we uh, perhaps um, prospect them, maybe perhaps we found them, um, is we, uh, we really want to focus on upskilling them. And we've always, as a, as a company, we've always focused on the development of, of people and giving, giving everybody an equal opportunity when they join, regardless of people's um, university um, results. Um, it's about what you do with your career moving forward. So, um, and, and so we're used to that. We're not afraid of developing um, our graduates into being, you know, fantastic leaders and managers. Uh, but now, now so more than ever, this really counts because um, we found that um, because the students weren't, um, you know, perhaps having those um, employability sessions or um, doing, you know, doing much of our own employability because let's face it, some of these jobs weren't open. They weren't thinking about, you know, can I get it? Where am I going to get a job? Because there aren't, there weren't many. Um, is we, we started to run, um, and this is very early in the pandemic, um, a weekly drop-in session for, for all candidates. Um, because a lot of our candidates um, also come from, you know, they may, might be first um, in their families to go to university. Perhaps they don't have those role models at home. Um, they don't have those resources. So by implementing this weekly drop-in session for all candidates to come on at the time they could do it once, they can attend um, several times at any point in their application process to hear about, um, you know how how to succeed, how to how to shine in that last and final um, interview, and we'd always bring a diverse panel to represent females um, as well, because this is one of our initiatives to make sure that we we are attracting um, more females into what is perceived a male dominated industry, um, and that has really helped um, the conversion of our um, of our of our applications or our our, um, our candidates into our, our graduate scheme. I think it's about a ten percent. Um, we've also um, started um, to um, put together, we've, we've, we've been putting um, a national campaigns together for a little while now, one of them starting with the Embrace the Moment, which is focused on change during the pandemic, um, and then um, we're, we're currently running a bite-sized employability session. So we're reaching out um, to students that wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, come to, to us um, directly through the connection there, maybe they saw our brand, which is giving them the confidence. Um, so it's a bit more of outreach, um, and and then when we when we do engage, obviously um, helping them see 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 you know place for them within the company. So we use a lot of um, strategic marketing. We have a lot of diverse um, senior management. We have lots of blogs that we use um, to ensure everyone can kind of see that they are represented in a in a company such as Enterprise, who's been you know recognized as being you know very um, a very diverse and inclusive employer. Monica, some employers have, have told us that as a result of the pandemic, greater use of technology, um, more students on platforms, actually it's been, um, it's been easier to reach a more diverse audience than one or two have tell us that's not the case. I just wondered how you'd find the results of the pandemic. Has it, has it, have you found it easier to get to a more diverse audience or, or very much there's still challenges still in place? I would say that really varies by university campuses where they have um, perhaps maybe structured um, student-led societies, organizations that have you know great strong reputations on campus, and it's been um, that sort of legacies led on uh, where maybe they've run a, an annual event. For example, we're we're coming into um, just left uh, the LGBT um, History Month um, and now into um, our Women's Month of um, you know for for International Women's Day. So. If they were used to putting these events together and and um, and connecting and engaging with employers to help support these these um, these events, and I think those will carry on. It's those ones that I suppose there isn't that strong um, student-led society is that it's harder to engage on social media um, because you just you know you don't have those those groups um, to help you um, to help target. It's it's really just um, you know kind of an open field. Great, thanks, Monica. Um, and the same to you, Andrew, just to kick off with really around that whole DNI piece. Obviously, it, it is very important to yourselves. And, and it's yeah, here's how is that changing and evolving, I guess, um, the, um, the, the work that you're trying to do? Yeah, I, I'll start off just talking about some of the some of the programs or opportunities that we that we offer. 
Um, we, we have a program called a, a Women in Business program, which is specifically an undergraduate program. Um, you know, it's been a, a, a long-standing challenge for our sector, and not just our sector, but you know, we our, our, our split of male, male and female applicants and hires isn't isn't 50 50 we, re, we recruit more males so we we have um it used to be called a shadow shadow female leader program it's now called the women in business program that we've run we run for a few years we also introduced last year a similar program called black talent in business as well um which obviously you know indicates that trying to recruit more black heritage students is you know is is, is a priority and has become a priority for us as well and the, the, the other area that we're really focused on when it comes to diversity is, is social mobility or widening participation. Um, and whilst we don't currently have a, a you know, a, a program for, for WP students, you know, we do work with a number of organizations. So we work with, with Upreach for the last four or five years, for example, um, and, and we've, we've evolved and built on that the relationship and the work we do with Upreach. We also work with the likes of the Sutton Trust, Social Mobility Foundation as well. Um, the other the other piece to add just on that is you know there's been so many challenges around the pandemic um you know certainly too many to list i think one of them which we've seen as a real opportunity has been that whole virtual engagement piece and i think that the one thing that that has allowed us to do is to reach more universities you know we're, we're an employer who recruits um, you know, I know we're not on our own here, but we've always re re recruited. We've tried to recruit from a real wide range of universities. We recruit. We have programs for students in every year group, um, and we recruit from all degree disciplines as well. Um, a, a head of head of career service said to me a while ago, "Well, you know, why don't you do more directly with academic departments?" And I said, "My answer was, it's it's difficult because every academic department, in theory, is." is is important to us and that you know that that, that becomes a big challenge um so pre-pandemic pre we probably visited and this took a huge amount of time and resource from the team and beyond but we visited probably between 65 and 75 universities each year across the uk um and now you know and as part of our strategy is to reach and work with and to to, to try and promote our events and opportunities and resources through every you know uk institution and beyond um we don't act really really proactively target institutions outside of the uk but our aim is to have you know a relationship with a careers contact at every uk university to promote our virtual events and i know you know this year and last year through the, through our the technology that we use we use a platform called our virtual park to run most of our events we had students from 150 uk institutions or thereabouts so you know effectively we've, we've doubled our reach in terms of the universities we work with. And I think it was always very, very difficult pre-pandemic when we had lots of institutions approaching us say, we'd love you to come along and do X, Y, and Z. And quite simply, we just didn't have the resource to, 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 do, to do something at every university. And, and you know, often we were saying no, which wasn't a great message. With, with, you know, yes, we're wanting to interact and engage with every university. The way we work with universities is very different now. You know, absolutely. But, you know, again, we, we, we see that as a positive and we hope, you know, over time, you know, the diversity of our hiring pool will be will, will be different. Um, you know, it, it, it will be more diverse. Great. Thanks, Andrew. You got you answered my, my follow on question there and there as well. So um, I'll, I'll go to you first for the next one, actually, I had a, that I wanted to cover. And, and you started to touch on it, actually, that that in curriculum activities. And, and of course, it is a challenge every um, every department is different. There's 150 degree awarding institutions in the UK. Um, I think it's more than 150 now. Um, but how actually do you do you um, approach that kind of that experience? learning experiential learning that in curriculum stuff because we know it does work quite well for students um is it something that you are able to to still put sort of a big chunk of resources into um not 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 a, not a huge amount sadly um i think what what we do try and do is through and i think what one thing that's really important here is to ensure that you know when we're talking about virtual engagement i think we've all tried and tested different things and some haven't worked and are we still getting it right no we're still looking to try and develop that that virtual engagement piece and and, and the technology that we use i think the technology that an organization does use is really really important i think you know we thought long and hard about this and you know our virtual park does allow us to engage with students in a variety of ways you know and, and, and through the technology we can run networking sessions panel events one-to-ones um, you know, we run skills workshops as well. So we are very much focused on that whole kind of skills development piece too, um, but actually building it into the curriculum it is slightly different. 
we're looking to do we're looking to do an event we've got an event coming up um not this month but next month that we're doing specifically for humanities and social sciences students as well so we are looking to to try and work with students who ordinarily wouldn't think oh a career at pwc is probably not going to be for me um because i'm not studying a, a relevant degree to, to really showcase that how the skills that students who 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 study a, you know, what would be classed as in their own eyes a non-relevant degree can be applicable and transferable to, to, to an organization like, like PwC. So that, that's the type of approach we're now taking as opposed to perhaps the more traditional, you know, working with a number of institutions and thinking about the academic curriculum and how, and how we can contribute it in that way. It's amazing. The one thing that hasn't changed in the nine years or so I've been doing this job is that is is that is quoting that statistic about how few employers actually stipulate a degree discipline, and um and how many um students and others actually still look like oh they're, <laughs> they're kind of their eyes open. Um, I think there's sort of very strong. We still got to get that message out there a lot more about the openness of the UK in terms of students that we look at. So anyway, I've got, I'm dangerous of taking us down a, down a rabbit hole. Um, Monica, um, same kind of um uh, question to you really in terms of um working curriculum experiential learning is it something that's important to to your work with universities and students is it something that you're able to do more of less of as a result of the pandemic um, what are your thoughts um we we definitely see this as um the best way for us in terms of our, of our recruitment marketing is to be in curriculum with the schools um, we focus on that this year and we've had some great success um with with working with some of our our, um, our universities across the, the country and we have but we have of course work to do not just with the you know because this is a, a graduate management um, training program it's um, we, the majority of our of our candidates do come from the business school but it, it doesn't mean that we, we can't hire someone that comes from humanities um, so um, so I think it's it, to be fair to everybody and to give everyone equal chance I think starting with curriculum where they when they start early um, in terms of um, being exposed to um, to industries and to different types of skills that those industries require, and you know they get a feel for the for the work because I think sometimes, uh, well, mo a lot of times, students will be attracted by a brand and they think I want to work for that shiny brand, and they don't actually know what um, what types of roles and what types of skills they need in order to get a job within that company, um, and and so therefore those ones that are as developed and skilled, those, those um, students don't get those jobs. Um, so I think starting early um, with, um, you know, with, with in curriculum um, is, is the best way um, to start, um, obviously great brand um, awareness, um, but also starting to, to upskill those, those, um, those students. And we do um, run a couple of marketing activities already with, with, um, with the business schools where it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a challenge. So there's a, there's presentation, there's communication skills, there's prizes at the end of it. And we get to, you know, fast track um, winning teams to, to our graduate roles. So there's, you know, there's something for, in, uh, something for them um, at the end. It could be just a, a digital um, certificate, which students love um, as well. So, so it is become easier now with the virtual world to um, to be able to um, to bring these types of events for uh, on on campus to the to the um, to fa uh, faculty staff um, and I think they they once they hear it and once they see the the benefits um, they're then they're bought in because there's you know there's a business the live business case that can be delivered by an employer who wouldn't want that um, but there's obviously work around, um, you know, it takes months and months, sometimes years to get, um, you know, change in the curriculum. So it's, it's one that obviously needs to, needs to be planned and, um, and, uh, and worked on, um, but definitely worth it. Yeah, I think it's going to be quite interesting to see with, um, you know, when you look at what's happening coming from the Office of Students, response to Orga, you know, that focus on graduate outcomes, if that's going to um, be, be an additional boost in terms of, um, of, um, of encouraging more, um, more, more academics, more courses to look at that, that employer um, content in the, in the curriculum. Um, do you find it, it generally makes a difference, Monica, both in terms of who you recruit and hire? Do you end up actually recruiting people directly from that involvement? or is it something you find that just generally I guess improves the, the employability of all students in general? No there's definitely an increase of, um, of the way that the, the um, applicant performs in the interview. They're much more informed, confident, um, they've already uh, without having to do too much research themselves already understand the values, the history of the company. So 
you know, as a recruiter, when you have someone that's already been through those and engaged um, on that level, they come pretty well prepared um, and, and it shows. Um, and as I said, you know, um, we're not necessarily a brand that a student might see and say, well, my aspiration is to work for a car rental business. It definitely wasn't mine, but once I understand, uh, once I understood the, what the training program was all about, what it could provide me um, in the short, medium and long term, then, and, and, and understood the culture and, um, and the values, then that for me was more, way more important than the product itself. So that's why we do see um, a lot more success when students do come from those activities and, and have been working with us on that level. Um, I'm conscious of time and we have got some questions on the q and I'm going to, the last couple of questions I'm going to ask you, I'm going to sort of try and merge into one as it were. So, um, um, Andrew, just coming to you, I was, um, um, like Monica, I mean, you, you are a volume recruiter. You've got lots and lots of op opportunities. I know there's always a slight argument about who is the biggest in the recruiter, biggest in the UK amongst amongst that very small handful of a thousand plus recruiters. Um, so obviously there's, there is the pressures of volume. It's volume recruitment. You've got to talk to a lot of students, um, a lot of applications. I mean, I'm staggered by the number of applications because I see it in our data. You know, it's it's um, the applications um, you all get is, is easy. I would say double um, when I was um, at EY 10, 10 years ago. So there's obviously a, a tension there between balancing that need for scale, but then also, you know, students need a personalised contact. Mm. Um, and and there's also, I guess, the, there's a lot more data available now. So um, there's a lot more data on candidates. It's easier to um, to track people through systems, et, et, et cetera. Um, and I was just going to get your sort of thoughts, really, around um, actually do you see that? How do you how do you deal with that tension between the volume and the personalization piece? And is there a role for data there in terms of helping you target students better and get to get to the students you want you want to talk to? Because I suppose the the unattainable perfect scenario is you only talk to the students that really are right for you and want to work for you, and it's one to one hiring. So I don't know. Could you just uh, that's a very very kind of random way I think of asking a, a couple of things around yes that that broad approach to the funnel, then getting to the personalized piece and data. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think on the on the data point, yeah, it, it, it's you know incredibly useful for us. You know, not just data that we're able to report on, but also you know data that's available through a whole you know range of organisations. HISA or JISC, you know, com comes to mind. You know, of, of, of data that we can obtain there as well. I think if if you think, you know, what what what's data told us? Data told us. Um, you know, we we need we need more diversity on our hires, and we need to recruit from from a broader range of universities. Um, I, I think you know we've recruited from the last probably ten years between about seventy five and one hundred UK universities. Great, but typically a, a high proportion of the hires that we make have probably been from the, uh, the, the 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 universities that are slightly less diverse. Um, you know, in, ter in terms of those student populations. So I think, again, you know, linking that into our approach now and our strategy and the virtual engagement piece, you know, we, we very much hope that having that broader reach will will mean that we, we, we see more of a diverse pipeline and more diversity in the hires. I think as well, if we think back to um, that non-relevant, relevant degree piece and some of the stuff that we're trying to do with likes of humanities or arts languages, social sciences students, you know, we're also aware from some of the data that we, that, that, that's, it's available that some of those courses have a higher proportion of females studying them. So it's not just about targeting students who are studying non-relevant degrees, but for us, it can really help with that with that gender piece as well, which is you know continues to be a challenge for us. Um, the, the the scale versus that that personalization that, that's difficult. You know, it, it 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 continues to be really really difficult for us. And yeah, you know, there's some great technology out there as well. But I think you know, do, do students still want that personal touch? Absolutely. The whole candidate experience is extremely important for us from the moment they either come to an event or you know they enter our process and, uh, and our pipeline and we do i think we're fortunate that we have you know a, a, a decent sized team who are based all over the uk who work specifically within student recruitment um, but we also engage with lots of individuals from the business you know who work in audit tax consultancy we set up we have a buddy system we have new joiner committees we have pre-joiner events that we try and do in person, even though we're doing lots and lots virtually. All of our new joiners pre-joining in autumn will have had the opportunity to come in and meet people in person, both recruiters and um, uh, 
graduates who've, who've, who've joined joined the prior year, for example. So yeah, that's difficult. Um, you know, those individuals who make up our new joiner committees, our buddies, you know, our welcome team from those lines of service have their day jobs, you know, and there's pressure from, you know, their audit teams, their TAC teams to do their chargeable work. But at the same time, I think we're fortunate that from the very top and the senior leadership that we've got at PwC, they recognize the importance of, of, of hiring, you know, good and diverse talent into the firm. Um, so there is, yeah, there's that senior support, which helps us, but it, it, it's difficult without a doubt. Yes, and you are in those constant challenges of, you're right, people have day jobs, so getting the line involved in being out there on campuses is always a, a challenge, isn't it? Um, Monica, same question to you, really, just around that tension of um, of being a volume recruiter, having to talk to lots of students, but then also the personalisation piece, and does what role does data data play in that? Yeah, well, we are true, truly um, big believers that the better the data um, is, the better experience we can provide, um, but on the uh, on the other side, I think if we ask for too much, we risk discouraging um, people from completing the, the information. So we have to have a kind of a, a really good balance in between. Um, but, you know, like Andrew, we've, you know, we've identified that we have um, pockets of opportunity and, um, you know, the personalization is only viable really when you've got that longevity with the experience um, and for recruitment, it's, it's relatively very short term. So it's much more difficult. But when, when we do get the that engagement, we make sure we ask some really important questions that we can use. So that could be for us on um, the, the graduation year, the course where they want to work and then utilize that in our engagement so we can um, contact them when we have new graduate or placement roles open or when we let, want to let them know that um, we're still looking for for, um, for graduates, maybe the alumni, um, that those ones that we know that engaged with us a few years ago, but may not still be in their career choice. Um, so that's hugely important, in, important for us. Um, and we, we really just overall see technology as an engagement tool. So um, it does allow us to do what we do to this scale, um, but it also, um, the technology gives uh, access to us as a company. So being accessible is important um, and really key through uh, the webinars and the recordings that we have available for students to play back in their own time um, because um, otherwise, you know, they, they, they may struggle. Um, so having that hosted somewhere where they can come back um, and they're not missing out on anything. Um, so again, every, every candidate is going to have that extra level of support. Um, and it really allows um, those, um, those candidates to engage in their own time um, and, and have access to our resources as and when they want to. Great. Thanks, Monica. Um, as I said, I'm conscious of time. So we've got um, got some questions in the Q&A, which I'll, um, I'll just, just turn to now. Um, so one of the questions from Robert was talking about actually, yes, we've talked about technology, lots of stuff online being really good. Um, but he's asking about going back onto campus, um, sort of any thoughts on on the coming months, but also in sort of 18 months time, in a year's time, will market forces have driven everybody back on to campus all the time? I wonder if you had any, any thoughts on that. Is hybrid here? To, here to stay. Andrew Monica, who wants to take that one first? I'm happy to uh, try and get my crystal ball out to look at, look at what 18 months time offers. I think, um, yeah, I, I think we're not entirely sure, say 18 months, two years down the line, what will be happening. I think certainly, you know, I think the virtual piece has a huge part to play. Technology will evolve. Um, you know, technology evolves and will continue to evolve. And and, 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 you know, for, for the, you know, for the better when it comes to engaging with students, I think, you know, my other thought was it was something that I know, not just PwC. So even pre pandemic, we were toying with the whole idea of virtual engagement and how could we extend our reach. And I think the pandemics essentially accelerated that. So I don't think it was ever not going to happen. It's just been brought about far quicker by the pandemic. Um, technology plays an important role in, in all our working lives as well. Whatever, whatever industry and sector we are, we're in, you know, we're, we're, we're all working more virtually than ever. And I think, you know, some of that virtual engagement, I appreciate some student feedback will be, or oh, we find it very, very, very challenging. And we, you know, we'd much prefer the in-person approach, whether it be for an interview or an event or, 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 or something similar. The reality is that, you know, on joining a firm like PwC or, or another organization, they're gonna have to be doing quite a bit of their work virtually too. So they're gonna have to get used to that style of working as well. So I think using that as part of the approach, as part of the selection process or the way we engage with students during events will essentially help them to to recognize what will come so i think yeah not quite sure what two years time will look like but i think certainly virtual will 
continue to play a big part in what employers do. Monica, what are your thoughts? What is your crystal ball telling you? I wish I knew. Um, I, I think for us personally, although the technology has helped us um, communicate, um, engage, and, you know, based on the, the resources that we have, you know, I, I'm one, um, one recruiter and on the marketing um, department that deals with the whole, the, all the universities in the Southeast. Um, and there's, you know, five others um, that work alongside me that cover the country. So I would not have been able to do what I do if it wasn't for the technology. But I do think that there's um, that element of that, um, you know, personal touch. We do like to be in front of people. We do like to engage and and almost, you know, especially down those busy corridors and, um, you know, libraries where you get a lot of football. We like, you know, we like that interaction. Um, I think that may come back for definitely employers like us where we need to maybe um, um, do some myth busting about who, you know, who we are as a company and, um, and you don't always get that with um, with, with with having someone dial into maybe a, a virtual information session. It takes more than that. Um, it takes more than than just telling someone we um, you know we uh, we've been voted one of the you know top um, uh, fifty or seventy five for social mobility. You know sometimes you need to bring people you know to those in front of others and share their story. So for us, I think that's that's kind of where the future is um, is heading. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions here, both on the same subject, um, around international students. So asking around, actually, do you recruit international students? And also, um, I know there's lots of um, talk in the, in the university sector about the new uh, um, graduate immigration route. So I wondered if also if you've got any thoughts on about what that means for yourselves as, 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 as employers. I'm conscious of time, so we'll see if we can get through, get through that one. And then I'll go to Chris and Emily just for some final comments from, from yourselves. Um, Andrew and Monica, any thoughts of that? What's the, what What's, um, what's your situation with international students? Yeah, so we are um, now, um, we, we weren't pre-pandemic, but um, with some of the regulations, um, we have changed our approach. So we are considering all international students um, into our graduate roles, which is great. Um, we also find that those are the, the ones that are um, come to our sessions, our employability sessions, because they're really, um, you know, almost, you know, they, they really want to get their, their money's worth. They absolutely want to make their experience count. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, so, some of the challenges for us as a car rental business is, of course, the driving license is that criteria, um, but we make that, that clear to them. Thanks, Monica. Andrew, um, any thoughts from yourselves? Yeah, I'm trying to simplify what, what's quite a complex area. Um, yes, we're and complex and changing. Yeah, we, you know, we do. We, we, we've always um, been in a position to, to, to recruit international students, not for all of our graduate roles, but for a number. Uh, we, we make that very clear on the website just to say that some um, some of the roles that we offer um, you know don't don't meet the required home office criteria so um, you know sadly we're unable to but for the majority of our graduate roles we you know, we are able to recruit international students and again you know an international student should just check eligibility on the particular vacancy and the requirements that we've got in place for that yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think it's a subject that we, the IC will come back to, and we do actually quite a bit. We're members of ISEG, we're quite active involved in this in this space. Um, from what employers tell us, actually, it's not a challenge the number of international students they're getting to apply. Um, but I think also it's it's students and universities being aware of the cost implications for employers, even the graduate visa does have quite big compliance costs. So there's quite a lot of complex um, issues in there. I think the problem actually with employers that don't know about it so much is probably more in the SME space but but again that's a that's a whole other webinar topic there I think um Andrew and Monica great that's fantastic insights thank you thank you very much for both of you and, and your candor in terms of um talking through um where you're at at the moment um Emily and Chris anything that from what you've heard that you'd like to comment on or to come back to or anything you think we should follow up on as a result of this I guess um Emily I'll, I'll pass to you in a second but I guess from my point of view I would just um just echo what you said Stephen in terms of thanking uh Monica and Andrew for their their time today I think you know watching the questions come in they've been some really interesting topics and and certainly um a situation where we could have a many hour long webinar about a lot of the things that have come up in here today so um yeah it's been really interesting I appreciate everyone's um effort and commitment in uh, in taking part and uh yeah aside from that that's all I would add Thanks, Chris. Absolutely. I echo what Chris has said. Thank you so much for um, your insights. It's incredibly useful and interesting for me to hear, especially from 
coming from kind of the career space, it's always interesting to get these insights. Um, and I think it's great to see the roles that technology data can play going forward as we try to navigate this hybrid world and whether we go back to normal or whatever form it'll be over the next 10 years. Um, yeah, really interesting discussion. Um, thank you. And, and just one final thing for me to, to kind of sign off, um, just bringing it back to the, to the events that will, will be taking place in the next couple of weeks. The links were shared in there. I think there was also um, a link to the report itself. So if anyone has any interest in, in taking part, uh, feel free to get in touch. And, and I'm also available for any conversations around Handshake and, and you know, the types of information that, that I speak to our employer partners about. So yeah, more than happy to speak to anyone offline about anything that's come up today. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for me as well, once again, to every all of you for taking part. We've covered an awful lot of ground in the in the last um, 60 minutes and, and really looking forward to, to, to working with yourselves on those events that are coming up those round tables. Please do attend them. I think we're going to have, um, um, A, it's going to be great to have rich conversations continuing, but also the chance to meet face to face, which I'm really looking forward to. So, um, so yes, yeah, great. And great to be sharing, uh, to be partnering with you in this work, Handshake as well. Um, Chris and Emily, um, it's, um, I think it's a very good um, piece of work that our sector has been doing um, and shows a very good uh, it's a very good example of how we um can cl collaborate right across the, the spectrum all right i'll shut up for now um as i said um at the very start we'll be recording this so if there's anything that you missed and um, you'll be able to go back and look at the recording um or actually if you want to share it among some colleagues and peers please feel free to do that so it'll be up there in the next day or so um both on our website and also i think it's on the handshake site as well so so thank you very much everybody enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are and um, see you in person or online again soon hopefully thank you all very much once again take care now hey.